Hello, welcome to our praise on this Palm Sunday from St Peter's Elworth. Let us pray. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, help us by your grace to know you and love you, that we may, in our praise and prayers, follow you part your path of self-giving love. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thanks be to God. 
Good morning. Love in a real world. Where will we be this time tomorrow? Under the loosening of restrictions, we can once again meet up with one another in our bubble, in our back garden, weather permitting. Where will we be this time next week? Will we be visiting loved ones and friends, albeit with care? Will we be celebrating the approaching end of restrictions in June, hopefully? What a difference the coming week will make to us, I'm sure. 2000 years ago in Palestine, the world witnessed a week which was far more momentous. And it began in a very curious way with a triumphant procession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the arrival of spring and we ask for your blessing on us now as we consider this, the holiest week of the church calendar. Help us to understand what the events of this week should mean to us today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Last week, Anthony uh, heralded his talk with these words, if it had not been for Easter, Christmas wouldn't matter. Today we're going to look at the start of Easter, which is when Jesus entered Jerusalem in a great triumphant procession. It's such an important event that it's covered in each of the four Gospels. But it raises some important questions. Why did Jesus need a triumphant entry into Jerusalem in the first place? And why did he choose to ride on a young donkey? Why did so many people welcome Jesus on that Palm Sunday? And what did Jesus see when he entered the temple courts straight after he'd processed into the, the city? Crucially, why only five days later was there a cry for him to be crucified on Good Friday? Each of the characters in the Easter story has a part to play. Where, I wonder, would they be in one week's time? And what does this all mean for us today? Well, let's start off with why did Jesus need a triumphant entry into Jerusalem? As a 17th century commentator called Matthew Henry, he gives three reasons. The first was to show that he was not afraid of the power and malice of his enemies. Got to remember Jesus had made many enemies already because of what he said about the religious leaders, those who put unwelcome burdens on the backs of the ordinary people by interpreting the law so strictly and without any love that the people felt guilt and shame. The second was to be an encouragement to his disciples. After all, he'd been telling them about what was about to happen this coming week and it totally confused them. They were bewildered. They didn't know what was going to happen and they were worried and they were concerned. So this was his sign to them that actually I am triumphant. It's just not going to happen in the way you thought it was going to be. But for now, we are celebrating and we are enjoying this moment. And finally, a personal reason why Jesus would have wanted this. It was to show that he was not cast down or disquieted at the thought of his approaching suffering. Jesus knew that he was going to die. He knew the process that would be gone through of the humiliation of the Judean Judas betraying him of the things that would happen to him in the court, the lies that would be told, the abandonment by many and by the Roman authorities who could find no fault in him, but were too weak to say so and to save him. And finally, the crushing death that he would bear on Good Friday, the hours of agony that he would feel. He knew all that. This was his way of saying, I'm brave enough to face it and I'm going to go through with it, even though I know that it's going to be horrible. Why did he go in to Jerusalem on a colt? Well, a colt was uh, certainly something that would uh, uh, raise him above the populace. After all, he was used to walking everywhere. This was going to be something different. Why wasn't it a horse? After all, a horse is more grand, but a horse is a sign at that time of war and a king would ride a horse at the head of soldiers and Jesus wanted to show that he was coming in peace which would have been disappointing to many because they actually wanted him to be a war leader they wanted him to throw the Romans out of Jer Jerusalem and Judea Simon one of his disciples is referred to as Simon the Zealot the Zealots 
were a an organization of terrorists. They wanted to rid the country of Romans. So riding on a donkey was something that was perhaps a bit of a letdown. Finally, he rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey because of a prophecy in the Old Testament. Zechariah tells us, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this was to be the fulfillment of scripture. Why were there so many people there on Palm Sunday? Well, of course, he had many followers by this time, not just the 12 disciples, but also a much wider range of followers. And then there were those who were genuinely curious that uh, they wanted to find out more and they wanted to understand what Jesus was going to say in Jerusalem. And finally, there were inevitably the camp followers, what you might call the fickle followers who were impressed by the outward appearance of Jesus' miracles. And we have to remember that there were a lot of miracles before the prim triumphant entry. Three of the Gospels tell us of the curing of blind Bartimaeus of his blindness. And in John's gospel, immediately before, we hear of the raising of a man, a friend of Jesus called Lazarus, from the dead. This was unheard of. Nobody, nobody could raise anybody from the dead. That was something that was purely either a fiction or it was, if it was true, it was truly remarkable. So these people were following him for different reasons, but they were all participating in the triumphant procession. Jesus, upon processing through the gate into Jerusalem, which would have been a bit like uh, in modern times, somebody receiving the keys of the city, didn't hang around. He went straight to the temple, his father's house, as he called it. What did he do when he got to the temple? Well, he didn't do anything. He just looked. He looked around. He let what he saw absorb his mind. He would have been disgusted. We know that. Because when he went home to Bethany, the following day, he came back to the temple. He would have planned what he was going to say and what he was going to do. But we know what he did because a little later in Mark, it says this. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So perhaps not the best way to start the week. Of course, it got tougher from there onwards. We know that during the course of the week leading up to Good Friday, Jesus taught in the temple. And at every turn, the religious leaders, his enemies, tried to catch him out. They would use phrases like, on whose authority do you say these things? They would try and entrap him by asking him questions about paying taxes to the Roman authorities. And finally, they would ask him questions about the temple, at which Jesus would respond in words that were then twisted and used against him at his trial. So that was why five days later he was crucified. It was because of these manipulations of words, of misunderstandings, of basic threats to the status quo. Jesus, after all, was a revolutionary. He was peaceful, but he was still a revolutionary. That's the man-made reason, but there was another reason, and that's the hardest part for us to learn. It was actually part of God's plan. God planned that it would be like this, even though we find it hard to believe today, even today. And the people that were surrounding Jesus, what of them? The betrayer Judas, by Sunday of the following week, would be dead. He used his ill-gotten gains, 30 silver coins, to buy a field in which he hanged himself. Peter would still be feeling shame from having denied Jesus three times. The other disciples and followers would be in hiding. Very few of them were there at the cross. It was mainly Mary, Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who were there. The others went into hiding. Only slowly did it dawn on them that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And even Thomas, he was a tough nut to crack. He didn't believe it until he actually met Jesus and placed his hands in Jesus's wounds. Mary Magdalene and the women 
would have been rejoicing because they knew the truth, even though nobody else believed them. And finally, Jesus. What of Jesus on Sunday? On Easter Sunday, he would be alive. Having died on the Friday, he would have risen by Sunday morning. And by the evening, he would already be walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, where he would break bread and give thanks with two of his followers who had failed to recognize him until that time. And then, even before the night was out, he would appear again to his disciples and show himself. For me, this reading has a key verse, and it's this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's from Psalm 118. And also in that psalm are written these words. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Our application for today is that the triumphant entry was the opportunity for many people to welcome Jesus into the most important city in Judea. Although some then changed their minds, many more did not and indeed welcomed Jesus into their hearts. How can we be more welcoming to strangers who we find in Sambach, such as asylum seekers from war-torn countries such as Syria, or those who are considering a move to our country because of other persecutions? In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, many people were showing hospitality to angels without knowing it. So are we ready to actively welcome people to our country, to Sandbach, to our church? I hope so. The Easter week 2000 years ago really was a defining moment in world history. Jesus was around 33 years of age, but he had been preaching for the last three years of his life. And it's curious that the gospel spends a disproportionate number of words on the last week of Jesus' life. It's got to be for a reason, and it is, as we shall see next Sunday on Easter Sunday. Let's pray. Dear Lord, forgive us We pray for our, as we pray for our infirmities. Forgive us when we think only of ourselves. Help us to overcome our selfishness and to raise our eyes to those in need around us. Help us to be more welcoming and loving to your creation and to our neighbours. And help us to recognise and call out those who would twist and manipulate your words for their own ends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, on this Palm Sunday, we remember how you rode into Jerusalem to fulfil the prophecies and your destiny. We thank you how through your teaching while on this earth and through your death on the cross, you showed your real love for us all. We thank and praise you that by your painful death you took away the sins of all who believe in you and gave us the hope of everlasting life with you in the world to come. There is no gift greater than this and we pray that by our words and actions we will reflect your love to all those around us each day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dear God, As we have reached the anniversary of the first lockdown, we pray for the continued effort of the doctors, nurses and other NHS staff who have shown their unrelentless love in caring for COVID-19 patients. Despite the difficult circumstances, they have not given up. We also pray for the development and rollout of the vaccines which have helped the slowdown of this dreadful virus. We pray that the government will show compassion on poorer countries and share some of our surplus vaccines. We also pray that as as this lockdown starts to lift, that the Prime Minister and other health advisers will make the right decisions to help us move forward. We pray that we will be patient and help each other to keep to the rules for a few months longer in order to enjoy the rewards later on. Amen. Lord Jesus, we bring the problems of this broken world to you and pray for your grace and mercy on us all. Give world leaders and all in authority wisdom, integrity and goodwill to tackle the global issues of climate change and decarbonisation, clean water, sanitation and hygiene, equity in trade and displaced people and refugees worldwide. In particular, we bring before you the people of Syria, Lebanon, Iraq and the Yemen and pray for peace, reconciliation, rebuilding and justice. We pray for your persecuted church around the world and ask that you will surround them all with your peace, 
love and protection and will turn the hearts of those who plan to harm them. And we pray for the people of Myanmar that legitimate government will be restored with reconciliation and peace. In Jesus' name, Amen. Dear God, we pray for our church at St Peter's. We pray especially for David, our vicar, and Anthony, our curate, who have had to change their way of ministry during this difficult year. We also pray for Kate, our administrator, Paul and Steve, our church wardens, Mark, our treasurer, Catherine, our children's worker, and all the PCC who have helped our church to carry on its work and help each other in a challenging year when we cannot meet face to face. We thank you, Lord, that with technology and people's skills, we have been able to do so. As well as the weekly services and thoughts for the day during Lent, we pray for the upcoming Sambach Passion Play and the Children's Virtual Holiday Club, Rise and Shine. We pray that through these YouTube services, we have been able to reach out to more people and pray that we may be able to welcome them to St Peter's when we are able to meet again in church. Amen. And now we end with the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant, even though you are the eternal King. Give us by your Holy Spirit the will to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King in every aspect of our lives in the world today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, you gave all that you had for us in self-giving love. Help us, Lord, not to be driven by the world's vain pursuit of self-fulfillment, but by your Holy Spirit, enabling us to walk your way of sacrifice and selfless love. In your name we pray. Amen. And now, may the love of our Lord Jesus draw us to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.